Hi everyone, thank you for joining for DDU teaching this afternoon. What will be the penultimate session before the exams? So again, lots of uh, love coming from this end and for all of you guys doing the exams. Um, Chris Duncan is going to go through some general ultrasound. So there will be a general ultrasound question in the written and in the Viva. Uh, and it's not expected to be at a super high level. We're not going to ask you to tell me gradings of renal, I don't know, cancers or anything. You're expected to be at a CCPU level for most of this. And that includes lower limb, venous and arterial um, uh, blood flows, uh, fast scans, renal ultrasound, gallbladders, triple A's, lung, things like that. And you're expected to do it, at, you know, to be able to pick up things like, you know, a gallstone, a thickened gallbladder wall, uh, hydronephrosis, uh, free fluid in the abdomen in different areas. You know, it's not, it's not, as I said, it's super high level. It's relatively simple. And in that regard, it, I think we're really lucky to have Chris Duncan talking to us. So I'm, I think you've all met Chris. So Chris has come over from the UK. He's got his, what's known as the level two um, English um, British Society of Echo qualifications, very similar to the DDU in both TOE and TTE. Uh, but he's a little bit of an overachiever. And he also has written a textbook on general ultrasound in the critically ill. And it's a fantastic one that he wrote with one of the consultants in Birmingham called Saab Clare, who's another incredible intensivist over there. So, uh, yeah, we're really lucky to have you talking to us today, Chris. Thank you very much. And we'll probably get you to repeat this at least twice each year, because I think we're very lucky to have you there. Because as I said, it's not every day we get people who write textbooks on general ultrasound talking to us. So forgive me, I'm just in a family meeting, so I'm just going to pop back, but I'll come in and I'll, this is being recorded. And uh, again, thank you very, very much, Chris, for talking to us today. That works. Um, let me just share my screen. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, awesome, okay, fine. So I'm just gonna do a quick review of some general ultrasound. Um, uh, I guess I'm trying to, the stuff I'm trying to cover are, are perhaps maybe fringes of, of the core stuff. You know, I think probably everyone's able to identify some ascites and some free fluid and a little bit of basic stuff, but uh, maybe some of the extra bits and pieces that, you're, that you might see in, and might need to know about. Um, so I'm going to start with thoracic ultrasound and now thoracic ultrasound is more than just pleural effusions, as I'm sure we all know now. Um, and that's definitely come to light in, uh, you know, in, in, in COVID. Um, but I, I think it's a pretty high yield for, um, low effort discipline. It's pretty straightforward, particularly compared to echo and you can get a huge amount of findings. Uh, so we're just going to go through a few bits and pieces here. So, um, yeah. I guess, uh, Chaturi, do you want to go through um, this first image for me? So this is um, a single shot view of the right um, of the right mid zone of the lung, and just describe any of the key findings that you can see here for me. So you can see the dropout from the the ribs adjacent, and the lung parenchyma underneath looks to be consolidated i can't see b lines from the pleura shooting down further down in the in the in the deeper parts of the image though there there does appear to be some uh collapsed uh, b lines joined together it looks like there's consolidated lung yeah nice so i think the, the the key the key finding here is that you've got these these uh, fluid bronchograms that you can see uh, if i just go back and play this again you can actually trace some of these fluid bronchograms um going through the lung as you fan through so um just a little comment about terminology so calling things b lines b lines very strictly originate from the plural line so you can have comet tail artifact that is kind of a reverberation artifact that comes from deep to that. If you've got some subpleural consolidation or something and you've got some downward deflections coming from that, theoretically, I mean, it, they are not by definition B lines. So just a little thing about terminology. So um, I'll just show you again. So this is a, a fluid bronchogram. So this is one of the airways that has then been filled with a load of fluid. And that's something that we can quite commonly see on ultrasound. Um, so I guess the the question from this is how can you distinguish between 
atelectasis versus consolidation on ultrasound? With atelectasis, I would expect volume loss. So you wouldn't see fluid, you would you wouldn't see fluid. Um, <laughs> with with consolidation, you don't have volume loss typically, and the air spaces are replaced by fluid or blood or pus, depending on what the, the cause is. Yeah, great. So um obviously we're we're well and you know, the clinical history and the um, x-ray findings as well showing some volume loss um you can actually get fluid bronchograms in both in both atelectasis and in consolidation um in atelectasis often the 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 lung looks a little bit more homogeneous um a little bit less kind of gritty and nasty looking um to use technical terms obviously um but the other thing that is um more pathognomonic for uh consolidation is the presence of of air bronchograms particularly when they are dynamic so this is another example of a patient of a patient with uh, this horrible homogeneous looking um kind of lung parenchyma but in and amongst this you can see these dynamic air bronchograms and this is the appearance of bubbles of air moving up and down during ventilation. And that the fact that these are dynamic demonstrates that the proximal airways are patent. So this is not going to be a consolidation picture. Unfortunately, the longer this lasts, often the air is resorbed and um, replaced with fluid. So you can actually develop, um, if this is longer lasting, then you will develop fluid bronchograms. So the presence of dynamic air bronchograms is uh, pathognomonic for consolidation. Uh, whereas fluid bronchograms can mean either atelectasis or um, or consolidation. Nice. Um, just going a little bit, a few steps kind of less severe. So in early stages of, uh, of particularly community acquired pneumonia, you can get these early peripheral changes. So this, you can see a normal pl looking plural line here with a rib dropout. And then here you start to get these, these regions of subpleural consolidation. You can get some common tail artifact coming down from the from the um, uh, fluid air interface here, but you can just see that a bit of the of the plural line looks like a chunk's been taken out of it. And this is classically seen in early early community acquired pneumonia. And then as this progresses, you can see that this kind of chunk has been that's been removed from the plural line looks a little bit bigger. And this is actually called a shred sign, as though someone's grabbed the plural line and just dragged it down and ripped a part of the lung out. And this is a slightly more severe um, stage of pneumonia. And actually, you can also here see a paraneumonic effusion. And then as things get even more severe, then that will progress to a low bar consolidation. And here you can see that there's horrible looking atelectatic consolidated lung um, there are some dynamic air bronchograms making it look like it's more likely to be a, um, a consolidation picture and there's also a paraneumonic effusion. So that's normally the, the, the stepwise changes in, in pneumonia that you can see. Any questions about that before we move on to something else? Could we describe that as hepatization of the of the lung? Or is you that can. so absolutely yeah. you can call it hepatization of the lung. I must say I'm not particularly fond of that description because you can also um there are similar descriptions um of like mirror artifact of the liver across the diaphragm. So you can call it hepatized lung. Uh, but I think if you're going to be more accurate, I'd probably describe it as looking like consolidated lung with uh features of dynamic air bronchograms. Uh, with a paraneumonic effusion. So I think that's probably more accurate, but absolutely you do see in quite a lot of places uh, people describing it as hepatization. Chris, do the air bronchograms yes. always get replaced as the disease progresses? Uh, typically, yes. Okay, typically, yes. Um, you know, the, the longer that that is densely consolidated, the less, the more that the air is going to be resorbed and then it's going to end up looking like a, a, a um, fluid bronchogram. So it's, I mean, it's difficult to say how long they last, um, but you know, it's going to be individual for the patient. But I guess if you've got something that looks like this um, with fluid bronchograms, you're going to build it into the clinical picture anyway. So often lung ultrasound is more sensitive than x-ray for, for identifying consolidation. And um, 
you know it, if you have the suspicion that this is a that this is going to be a mnemonic process then then you fit the, these findings into that all right so um uh, prithvi do you want to just describe the image on the left to start with so this is this is at the right upper zone of the lung yep uh the so right upper lung lung ultrasound uh showing rib shadows and the intervening lung shows the pleural line uh but there's probably not um a lot of pleural movement uh, which is visible uh, on that image and the image to the right is a mode through the lung parenchyma uh, again raises a suspicion of underlying pneumothorax because there is uh, you know uh, uh, it's not the normal looking uh, seashore pattern. It looks more like a barcode pattern uh, and with uh, uh, poor pleural movement, uh, I would suspect a uh, uh, lying pneumothorax. Yeah, great. So the um, you correctly identified here that there's an absence of pleural sliding. That's the key finding. We're all very used to looking for pleural sliding on ultrasound. Um, now, I think I just want to emphasize with this case that not that not all absent pleural sliding equates to pneumothorax. And clearly we want to ensure that we identify those people with a pneumothorax. And it's obviously um, you know, our uh, top of our list of, of differential diagnoses, but there are lots of other things that potentially can um, cause this. So you know, if you put your tube in too far and end a bronchial intubation, if someone's got very severe bronchospasm, it can look like this. If people have had previous pleurodesis, then they may not have the pleural sliding. So, or or even bullous lung disease. So, there are lots of other other things that may indicate that, that may lead to an absence of pleural sliding. And the image on the right, um, I've left these arrows in, and I don't know if you can see. You're right. This doesn't look normal. This doesn't look like a classic seashore pattern. More of like that kind of barcode sign or stratosphere sign, depending on on how you want to describe it. But these arrows are pointing to these little reverberation artifacts here. Um, and this is actually called a lung pulse. And the lung pulse is um, cardiac transmitted pulsations. And the classic teaching is that this only happens if you have um, opposed pleura. So this may be a, a sign, maybe a finding that actually it's more likely to be one of the other causes of absent pleural sliding. Now, I think this holds true in, say, a a well population, but obviously we have patients who are very, very hyperdynamic and you get cardiac pulsation transmitted everywhere. So it may be less um, sensitive for that, but this is a finding that's described. And if you are, what's the most sensitive sign for a pneumothorax? I think. Lung. Sorry, what's the most specific sign for a pneumothorax? Is it a lung point? Yeah, great. So um, this is an example of a lung point. So you've got uh, pleural sliding on this side, no pleural sliding on this point. And then you where the um, where the pleura then meets once again, you have this downward deflection and you can see that moving back and forth. So classically, how I would do this if I see an if I see absent pleural sliding, I will then scan laterally as far as and then I'll keep sl sliding laterally until I find a lung point. The further lateral you go, the bigger the the um, the pneumothorax is going to be. Okay. Now you can't always find it; it can be quite tricky. But this is much more likely to be causing uh, caused by a pneumothorax. Any questions about that? No, thanks. All right, <clears throat> Yannick, do you want to take me through these two images? Uh, we've got two lung ultrasounds: one from the right mid zone and one from the right lower zone. So the right mid zone, um, you can see the acoustic shadow of a rib space. Um, there are pleura either side of this. Um, the pleura appears to be sliding, but there does seem to be some some lung pulsation um, on two D. And then the um, other abnormality appears to be a confluence of B lines. Um, I'd be worried about pulmonary edema here. Um, 
there are no air bronchograms or fluid bronchograms or dynamic air bronchograms I can see, and it doesn't appear to be consolidated. Um, with respect to the scan <clears throat> in the right lower zone, the liver's visualized um, in opposition to the diaphragm. Um, again, I think I can make out some lungs sliding. I'm not, I, th I think that's the diaphragm. Um, I can't see any effusions. Um, but again, there seems to be a lot of B lines there. Um, so all in all, I'd be worried that this patient has pulmonary edema. Yeah, awesome. So you've um, correctly identified that there's lung sliding and that there's very, very significant B line profile. Um, completely agree with that. Um, and on the image on the right, this is the um, this is the liver. So you've got the diaphragm that's being obscured by all this kind of curtain of um, of, of uh, B lines. And so what you can definitely say with these images is that there is what's called an interstitial syndrome process going on. Okay, so whenever you see B lines, comet tails, uh, and particularly when they're confluent like this then this is due to some ab abnormality in the interlobular septa that's causing these reverberation artifacts going down. So that may be fluid, but it may also be an inflammatory process. It may be an infected process. It could be a fibrotic process. So what you can definitely say here is that this is an interstitial syndrome that is not the, that needs to be kind of further delineated. There are a couple of features here that are a little bit unusual for pulmonary edema. And I completely agree that the by far the most common cause of uh, an interstitial syndrome is pulmonary edema, by far. And the incre increasing number of B lines increase severity of pulmonary edema. However, there are a few features here that are a bit unusual for pulmonary edema. Firstly, um, the plural line is quite thickened and quite irregular. And you may be able to see that there are some kind of regions of subplural consolidation. Um, you can probably see some kind of here and definitely around here where it looks like a bit of that pleura's been ripped off. Um, is that this shred sign that you were talking about before? Yeah, so this is this would probably be kind of nodular subplural consolidation. Um, and secondly it's a bit un it would be a bit unusual to have this severity of acute pulmonary edema without any pleural effusions adjacent to it so this may or may not be um, pulmonary edema but or there may be some pulmonary edema going on however i think the most likely cause of this is probably more like an interstitial fibrosis or an or a kind of interstitial um, new pneumonic process and just to compare that with an acute pulmonary edema um, can you just see how crisp and thin that pleural line looks? And, um, you know, obviously there's still loads of comet tails, bee lines, and they are starting to become confluent. You can see that by definition, this is where the definition of bee line bee lines come in, originates from the pleural line and um, and obliterates the A lines. So that's technically what a, what a B line is. But then if I um, just go back, you can see that comparatively the the plural line is very very unusual in in the, these images okay. so there are if we're trying to distinguish between them then classically i mean i've put odds uh because you know that's the most common thing that we think about but frankly it's any sort of interstitial process be that covid be that um kind of a, a, another viral interstitial um uh infection be it any cause of acute respiratory distress syndrome or um, or pulmonary fibrosis. So all of these things can have similar patterns. So classically, the pleural line is irregular and thickened, um, whereas in pulmonary edema, it's quite thin. The B line pattern, um, the in the um, kind of ARDS type picture or a fibrotic picture, then it's only going to be affecting the region that is affected. So um, classically in pulmonary edema, it's going to be more severe at the bases because of gravity. And then as you ascend the chest, the number of B lines will often, often um, diminish. And then as you diarrhea the patient, then they will descend back down the chest. Whereas in kind of an inflammatory process, 
you may get these multiple regions. You, it's not continuous. You may have some something that's affecting an upper region, but not a lower region. You may be unilateral rather than bilateral. So um, these are, it's a kind of pattern of where it um, where it's situated that also um, plays a role. The lung parenchyma itself in an inflammatory process, there's usually some degree of some a subpleural or lobar consolidation associated with it as well. And the effusions are much less common. Um, now, clearly, we have multi um, kind of multiple pathologies coexisting in some of our patients and you know, longer term um, patients who are intubated, you may start to see some dependent um, edema and effusions, but um, clearly that's going to be much more common in severe pulmonary edema. And then I just want to put these next to each other as well. Uh, these are the same images, but I just want to um, give you the opportunity to directly compare them. And really, it is that plural line that's that's the the, the telltale sign. Any questions before I move on? Cool. All right. Miles, do you want to compare these two images for me? Um, so we're looking at, sorry, two seconds. <laughs> it was probably not, not kind, was it? Sorry, no, sorry. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> So looking at curvy linear um, probe images, presumably in long axis and transverse of a large. Um, sorry, these are two separate patients. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I could have been more clear about that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just trying to, I was still internally trying to work out what we we're looking at. Yeah. Um, so this is, if we're still talking plural ultrasounds um, here on the left-hand side, um, we can uh see uh what looks like um a normal uh uh parietal uh, plural surface than a large um uh, echo free space with a long linear echo density um waving around um within it um attached to what appears to be consolidated a tail of consolidated lung um which uh whereas on the right hand side you've got a similarly large um uh, echo free space with more complex um, and multiple um, linear uh, frond-like echo densities within it, um, with an area of uh, what looks like hepatized lung in a kind of triangular shape, which also appears to have static um, kind of air bronchograms um, within it, uh, and appears to have a lung pulse and that there's kind of transmitted cardiac um, oscillations um, within it. So to compare the two, I guess, the fluid on the, the both both fluid echo densities appear simple, but there's more complex um, kind of uh, stranding in the plural space, which maybe on the left hand side might be more consistent with chronic infection or inflammation. Awesome. Um, yeah, so you've definitely correctly identified that there's large effusions bilaterally. Um, this is called the jellyfish sign. Seriously, the the plural plural signs the, the names of them are terrible but um i think that the key thing i want to show here the, the other thing just to say beforehand is you look at this diaphragm how that it's actually in kind of being because of its being under pressure it's actually being inverted so you've um the the weight and the pressure of that fluid is pushing that diaphragm down um so the the major difference here is the mobility of the of the collapsed lung so on the left side, you can see that that is waving around very dramatically during ventilation. Uh, whereas on the right, it's pretty static. You know, you've got not a lot of movement of any of these of any of these consolidated um, lung, and that probably it's not a it's not a um, exact science, but that probably indicates an increase in density of this fluid. So if you've got a bit of collapsed lung waving around very dramatically here then it's most likely to be a simple effusion, most likely to be a maybe a transitive effusion. Whereas if you've got a, a very static looking lung, it's not moving around a huge amount, then the density is definitely going to be higher. So that so comparing these two, that's probably what I would be concerned about. If I saw this kind of um, effusion, I mean, I think you'd probably want to drain it anyway based on this, but um, I'd be very worried that this is a complex effusion. Or, or at least something that is that is a uh, higher density or perhaps an extra date. But again, it's not a not an exact science. 
Does that make sense? This is an, is an example of a definitely a complex effusion. Again, terrible, terrible uh, names for signs, but this is called the plankton sign. But uh, this is showing a very complex effusion. Now, you could probably mistake this for consolidated lung uh, because it looks quite dense, looks looks like it could be a structure. But if you put a bit of pressure on or, or move the patient, then you will often see this swirling around. So this is a this is someone who had a hemothorax and it started to clot, um, and clearly this is a large hemothorax um, and something that's probably happened quite quickly because it's all a similar um, echo density. So this grittiness and everything, this is still fluid, but this is um, a hemothorax. I think this is probably something that everyone could <clears throat> recognize as a complex effusion. You can see all these dramatic septations. This is probably not something we're going to be able to drain with a simple pigtail drain. And this is someone who had tuberculosis. And lastly, for pleural ultrasounds, I've already done half the time on this, but um, this is another patient with a hemothorax, and this is called a hematocrit sign. And this is more indicative of a slower bleed. And the reason is you can see different densities of fluid within this pleural cavity. And you can, and that indicates that blood has been clotting at different rates. And uh, maybe there's some older blood mixed with some newer blood. So that is another hemothorax, but compared to say this one, it's probably a slightly slower bleed. All right, that's all I've got for pleural ultrasound. Is there, are there any questions before we move on from that? Okay, great. So abdominal ultrasound, there's obviously tons that we can look at with abdominal ultrasound. And the classic one is that we want you to be able to identify free fluids, maybe identify a, um, a triple A, but there are other things that are cropping up more and more, particularly in the right upper quadrant or renal tract ultrasound. Uh, so, um, Yannick, can you just describe to me the anatomy that you can see with this image? This is taken from the right upper quadrant. Uh, so this is a curvilinear probe, the right upper quadrant um, with what appears to be uh, liver and, and drop out from rib shadow on either side. Um, there is an uh, echo free space um, which is linear or le it's elongated um, and uh, of ovular in shape and it appears that it has well-defined margins that are echo dense and and thickened um, or rather that are echo dense um, and quite bright so I'm worried that this is a um, dilated gallbladder um, with perhaps thickened wall, um, depending on the patient history and the context, this might represent cholecystitis. However, against that, there's no sludge and there's no stones with ring down artifacts. Um, that's all I have to say. Great. And what about this area here? What What is this? Uh, I wonder if that's the porta hepatis. Yeah, um, nice. Very good. So this is, this is actually a normal gallbladder. Uh, so just uh, dem trying to demonstrate the anatomy. So we've got the gallbladder, we've got the anterior wall, and we've got the adjacent liver. And we've got the portal triad here. And the portal triad is made up of the portal vein, the CBD, and the hepatic artery. You'd want to zoom into this if you want to delineate the structures. And play just simply placing a bit of color Doppler over this can distinguish between the hepatic artery and the CBD. Yeah. Um, so if you wanted to look at, I think firstly, from what you said, a, a dilated gallbladder, it's quite difficult to know for sure um, based on the fact that the people's fasting status is often different. Um, and we probably wouldn't be directly measuring the gallbladder, but you're absolutely right. We would be measuring the anterior wall. And this is obviously a structure that's very thin. So it's uh, prone to error in your measurement. What kind of uh, wall thickness have you got in your, your um, mind for uh, what might be a thickened gallbladder wall? Anything greater than three millimeters. Nice, very good. And what other features of, um, of cholecystitis might you see on here? You mentioned that there could be a cause, so say sludge or gallstones. Any other features other than a thickened Peri wall? Pericystic edema. Yeah, yeah, and, and fluids, yeah, so some pericholecystic fluid. 
so this is this is how you would measure gallbladder. So make sure you zoom in. Um, you can see that this you've got this hyperechoic region here, and you're trying to measure um, an AP diameter there. Um, we don't measure the posterior wall because uh, you've often got artifacts. You get um, acoustic enhancement through the gallbladder can make it look brighter and thicker. This is an example of a thickened gallbladder wall, and you can see it looks quite edematous, and it, there's some pericholecystic fluid here. Yep. Uh, what about this? What can you see on this image? Tell me, Chris. Yeah, anyone really, but yeah, sure. Do you want to carry on with this? Um. Yeah, so this is again curvilinear probe with uh, the um, liver visualized and predominantly the um, left lobe of the liver is visualized. Again, the gallbladder um, is in view, I might say, on sort of long axis. There are some um, hepatic veins dropping into view. I think that's the right hepatic vein dropping into view with resp respironic movements of the liver. Um, again, the porta hepatis is visualized in the bottom left sector of the image. Um, and then there's significantly, there's a bright, um, echogenicity within the gallbladder, um, um, cavity with an acoustic shadow, um, inferior to it or deep to it, I should say. Uh, and so this, this would make me, um, suspect a, a gallbladder stone or cholelithiasis. Nice. Yeah, very good, very good. So, um, I mean, I guess for cholelithiasis, we need to be looking at the um, CBD diameter as well. Um, but yeah, this is gallstone. So classic appearance of a gallstone uh, without any features of cholecystitis. Um, so you can get a slightly trickier looking gallstones. So this is, this is something called a wall echo shadow. Um, and this is where you've got a very large gallstone. And what you can see here is a, is the gallbladder wall, and then you've got this hypoechoic stripe here, and then you have the the gallstone with um, acoustic shadowing deep to it. So you don't often don't get that classic nice view of the gallbladder, but um, there is definitely a, a some artifact there and the stone. All right, um, uh, just do you want to just go through this image and maybe describe what um, the features here are. Again, this is from the, this is again from the right upper quadrant or the kind of, um, right, yeah, the right side of the um, abdomen. And we've just rotated our probe by 90 degrees from our previous image. I rotated the probe by 90 degrees from the previous yeah. image. So now we are looking at the gallbladder in short axis here. So I think what I'm seeing here is a thickened enhancing gallbladder wall with some fluid between the, there's free fluid between the liver and the gallbladder. There is also free fluid around the liver. The gallbladder wall is bright and there appears to be fluid within the wall of the gallbladder as well. The brightness of the gallbladder is also concerning for edema. There's no dropout to make me think that it's calcium or like a porcelain gallbladder. And what 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 is this structure here? And this structure. So I think the the lower structure is the gallbladder. In short, I don't know. That's fine. So this, <laughs> so um, this, this structure here is a gallbladder. So it's a slightly funny um, angle, but what this is is the um, portal triad, just in a different cross section. So this okay. is classically the picture that you would do to measure the diameter. Oh, of the now gallbladder. I understand. Yeah. So that's the CBD there. <clears throat> Absolutely. So this is called a gun barrel view of the of the um, portal triad. So you've got the portal vein here, 
And then this here is a CBD that runs mm. along the top of it. So like a site or like a gun barrel. And then you still get the hepatic artery and cross section. And again, that's something that you can see with um, with uh, color Doppler. I agree, there's definitely fluid adjacent to the liver. Um, mm. The measurement of the of the gallbladder wall is um, not doesn't tend to be done from this view. You really want to get that classic um, of exclamation mark, a long axis view. And that's where the where you would measure it. But this is just just to show that the anatomy is um, the CBD going over the top of the portal vein, and then the hepatic artery there. Mm. Here is some. So this is an example of a CBD that's being measured. Um, what kind of what kind of um, diameters are we thinking for for a dilated CBD? 0.5 uh, millimeters or less. I think more than one is dilated. Yeah. So being so it actually depends on age. So classically it's described as four less than four millimeters is normal, but then for every decade over 40 years old you are, you add an extra millimeter to the normal range. So if you're 18 years old, it should be less than four. If you're 60 years old, it should be less than six. But obviously again, very, very fine measurements. Uh, so there is a lot of room for error. These are some more examples. So you can see very dilated CBD here. Um, and we know it's a CBD because we've put some colored Doppler over it. And um, this is another example of a different patient. You can see blood flow in the portal vein and a dilated CBD. Yep. All right, uh, Prithvi, do you want to describe what you can see in this image? So, uh, yeah, abdominal ultrasound looking at the liver. Um, and we've got a pulse wave Doppler gate on uh, probably the hepatic vein and uh, showing a venous profile on the uh, spectral Doppler trace. So it's probably a, a hepatic vein uh, Doppler trace. Okay, so... Um... What is a what would you normally see in the hepatic venous um, Doppler profile? Um, normally, there should be uh, you know a S a D and a, a reversal, but there's nothing on the on the bottom of the baseline on this. Yeah. Okay. So we what we have here is a is a um, right upper quadrant view. Um, granted, you can't see the walls of the of the uh, vessel, but we've got a structure with continuous flow, and that continuous flow is also um, towards the probe. So this is an example of flow within the portal vein. Portal vein. Yeah. So this is classically described for this um, in this direction as hepatopetal flow. That's completely normal, and this is a normal um, uh, portal venous flow. So continuous flow towards the probe. Now, the reason I've included this is because we've started to look more at the portal vein. You know, it's becoming more popular when we're talking about vexus and you know, jury's out about vexus. You know, it still needs to be, um, you know, it's been looked at in a post cardiac surgical patient for congestion, but there, you know, clearly there are other populations that we're not sure about. Um, but with increasing congestion um, and pressure, then you're gonna get something that looks a little bit more like this. And you can see that the, the portal venous profile becomes slightly more pulsatile. And it begins with just being only mildly pulsatile, but then it becomes more progressively pulsatile. And the um, vexus cutoffs are 50% pulsatility okay, for um, kind of moderate to severe. Yeah. Uh, so this is something that we can look at as an additional step um, in someone who we think has got venous congestion. So there are multiple ways that we can do this. We can uh, be looking at the portal vein from the uh, right upper quadrant view, you know, often a slightly more, um, uh, looking slightly more posteriorly than we would do for your fast view. And you can see that this is a right upper quadrant view. Um, and then you see the portal, the portal vein coming fr um, from the far field towards the screen, to, towards the probe. And this is classically going to be red flow um, coming towards you and hepatic venous flow doesn't go in that direction. 
Chris, can I ask? Yeah. I'm yeah. Appreciating that you may or may not be examining. Um, when you say the jury's out on Vexus, should we just avoid if we get shown a picture with pulsatility, should we just note that it's pulsatile and there may be congestion, or is it okay to talk about the you know the zero one two grading, or should we just leave that out? So in your opinion. This is this is portal venous pulsatility is something that's used by sonographers and um and radi um radiologists to suggest that liver pathology may be congested so it isn't it isn't a completely new phenomenon it's not something that we've only just recognized it's something that's just been packaged together in a that was with a fancy term that's being used now in the intensive care population with POCUS so I think it's probably worth saying that it is potentially um, suggestive of venous congestion um, and that uh, you can then integrate that also with um, hepatic venous um, a Doppler profile and potentially renal Doppler profile. Um, mm -hmm. Although that is a, I, I suspect a renal Doppler profile. I don't know, but I suspect a renal Doppler profile would not be in the the DDE because it's technically quite challenging, particularly in our population. So um, I think portal venous positivity is a relatively straightforward sign. And I think if you if it was shown, I would probably say that th this may be indicative of venous congestion. Thank you. And can I ask one follow-up? Yep. You said 50% was severe. Is, mm -hmm. is it up to 30% that you can have before it's mild? So where what's the acceptable up and limit of... Well, I think the, the key thing is that it's a, it's a continuum. So uh, this is this is normal and this yeah. is severe. And yeah. then any sort of pulsatility in there is probably going to... You're probably going to say it's starting to become mild to moderate. I, I think it's less... They, I think they classically say less than 30% is mild, 30 to 50 is moderate and over yeah. 50 is severe. And you can actually get complete obliteration of the flow or reverse flow, which would obviously be very severe. But again, I, I think grading things and applying labels like that is a bit is a bit dubious. I think it's putting everything together with all your other findings. You know, if this patient had right heart failure and yeah. um, venous, you know, systolic flow reversal, and then you had this, you know, it all points towards the fact that they are also congested from a right side perspective. Thank you. Okay. Um, so um, I don't know if, uh, uh, Chitari, do you want to go through this, um, this picture? So this is um, this is again imaging the the same from the same location, uh, but there are a few other findings, and and I guess I've included this just because we are starting to do a bit more Doppler, and we may find things that are a little bit unusual. And I, you know, this is obviously not maybe isn't something that will be core curriculum, but if we see it, then we need to um, recognize what it is. So let me see if I can butcher this. Uh, this, <laughs> this uh, it looks like I'm looking at the liver. There is free fluid around the superior margin of the liver there. And there is a colored Doppler applied to it. It demonstrates blue flow away from the probe. And there is a pulse wave gate applied and it shows linear non-pulsatile flow below the line. There is a trace above the line on that pulse wave Doppler trace. I feel like this might be, I don't know what this is. Chris, <laughs> so this is you, like absolutely right. This is, this, there's definitely fluid superior to the, to the liver. This liver looks a little bit small and shrunken. It looks yeah. and it looks a bit irregular and nasty, doesn't it? So yeah. this is this is definitely someone with liver cirrhosis. Yeah. And the key thing here compared to the previous images is that uh, what you rightly recognize is that this portal um, venous flow is going the other way. Yeah. So this is hepato... oh, flow reversal. What am I saying? Exactly. Yeah. So this is hepatofugal flow. Yeah. Um, it looks blue rather than red and it's going below the baseline. So this is someone with who's who's probably got portal hypertension. Um, again, not core curriculum. This is just something that it, that if we're starting to image the portal vein, we're starting to look at these things, then we definitely might recognize things like this. Um, and classically, the the you can measure the portal vein to to recognize portal hypertension. Now, an absence of portal venous um, 
uh, dilation does not exclude portal hypertension. But um, if it's very dilated, then that is highly suggestive of portal hypertension. So the, again, there is some controversy, but definitely somewhere over 13 to 16 millimeters is going to be dilated. So this definitely looks dilated. And just to go back through some of these findings, so you've got a, um, a shrunken liver here, you've got adjacent ascites, and then you've got this nodular looking appearance of the of the um of the liver and this is indicative of cirrhosis the other thing that you can look at is classically comparing between the renal cortex and the liver so if you can see in this image on the left that they're pretty similar echogenicity they look very similar um, but compare it to the right you have a really quite a bright looking liver that looks a bit a bit big and then it looks bright compared to the renal cortex. This is someone with fatty liver disease. Um, now you've got to be careful because if someone's got chronic kidney disease, then um, then the kidney can actually start to look quite bright. So it can be affected by both pathologies. And just going back through the difference between um, hepatic veins and portal veins. Now this is done from, this is a, a hepatic vein that you can see draining into the IVC. This is deliberately done in the opposite to the echo orientation. And the reason for that is because echo orientation is not the same orientation as any other ultrasounds pretty much. So you can see that blood flow will be going in this direction. You can see very thin walls. They are, they are distinct walls, but they are thin and um, blood flow will be going in this direction and it drains into the, into the IVC. Whereas the portal veins will obviously not drain into the into the IVC, and they often have much thicker walls, and they come and they flow in a typically in a different direction. So those are the main differences between the hepatic and the portal veins. Yeah. And remember that we may pick up things that other people haven't necessarily picked up. So this is something that looks very abnormal in the liver. Um, just remember that. We may pick up things like this. We're not expected to be able to identify specifically what it is based on the character. This is someone with hepatocellular carcinoma. But what we do need to do is recognize it, recognize that it's not normal, um, describe it clearly, measure it, and um, speak to someone who knows more than we do. All right. So, Miles, um, can you describe to me? the um the difference between these two images this is on the same patient this time i recognize that they're only a static image so yeah. so both longitudinal images of the kidney with a curvilinear probe um the image on the left appears to have an adjacent spleen or liver depending on which side it is uh, and a large echo free space um, in the middle suggestive of calisteal pelvis dilation. Um, and the echo texture of the kidney itself has an irregular margin. Um, on the image on the right, uh, the um, kidney appears smaller, a more irregular echo texture um, without the prominence of the pelvic calicele system. So to kind of interpret, I guess, on the left, uh, there's some suggestion of renal tract obstruction, be it acute or chronic, um, uh, with relatively preserved renal parenchyma, whereas on the right, there is a smaller atrophic kidney with irregularity suggestive of chronic kidney disease without necessarily evidence of obstruction. Nice. So, um... Yep, I completely agree. There's unilateral hydronephrosis. Um, it's quite difficult to describe the margins um, based just on a, a single image. Um, and being atrophic, you really need some measurements. So um, again, just careful not to overcall that. Um, but absolutely, this is uh, features of unilateral hydronephrosis. So um, I guess you all know the how to look at the anatomy, but you've got the UPJ, the pelvis, the medulla, the cortex, and the capsule. Um, and then you've got progressive severity of hydronephrosis. Now, grading is obviously, again, very subjective all the time, but um, classically, you kind of a grade one, you'll just have a dilated collecting system. Um, 
the grade two, you'll start to get a little bit of renal pelvis dilatation, uh, but you shouldn't really have any calosseal dilatation. And grade three, you start to have pelvis and, and calosseal dilatation. Now, if you're getting onto grade four, which is severe chronic, then you start to get more of like this thinning of the, of the um, kidney um, with horrific looking um, dilatation. So this is definitely someone with a more of a chronic process. Sorry, right Chris, do you mind yeah. checking that previous picture again? Yeah. Is that, so the calyx is the star on the third image? Yeah, so this is this is um, this is kind of the the collective system here. This is the proximal part of the ureter, and then you've got ah. um, then you've got kind of a little bit more of the pelvis di dilating. I mean, maybe you can argue there's a bit of early calosseal dilatation here, and that, but here you can see that clearly the architecture of those calluses has started to become um, um, uh, impacted. And yeah, this is definitely someone who's got a, um, a significant hydronephrotic picture and you can see that most of the pelvis architecture is is now is now not looking particularly normal but then but then here you can see that the dilatation has become so significant that it's actually obscuring a lot of the cortex um and so this is definitely someone with severe chronic hydronephrosis Uh, just for the sake of time, I'll just try to go through a few of these last pictures. So again, we might identify things that, are, that we're not expecting. Uh, the image on the left has just a simple renal cyst. Um, I think it's always worth you know, highlighting these and mentioning it to people who um, who may uh, may know more. I mean, I think this is a simple renal cyst normally isn't uh, much of a problem at all. But clearly, when the entire architecture is affected, this is someone with um, polycystic kidney disease. Uh, then that's something that is clearly very significant. Um, and this is an example of someone with um, with a kind of uh, shrunken chronic kidney disease, um, atrophic kidney. Uh, this is so that a normal normal kind of uh, di um, diameter of a long axis of a, a kidney. Anyone know? Uh, Eleven, not, yeah. not twelve. Yeah, ten. Yeah, ten to twelve ish is the number I've got in my head. Um, and this is 8.5. The other thing just to note here is that clearly this image has been gained, uh, the gain has been optimized for this kidney, but you effectively cannot see the the liver at all. So this is probably a quite a, an echo bright structure that because we've optimized the image for this uh, for this structure, we can no longer see a very dark uh, dark liver. So this is clearly a, um, a more echo dense than this. I probably only, I mean, I've got two minutes left. So <laughs> um, if you want me just to quickly talk through this, then if everyone's still got time, then I then I can do it. It's, it's only a very short bit. You know, we're not doing any vascular access stuff. But I just wanted to go through some of the lower limb um, anatomy, some of the points that you look at. So um, Classically, when you're starting, um, when you're in the in the kind of um, upper part of the of the thigh, then this is the key, um, the key one of the first key landmarks that you're looking for. So this is without compression, and this is with compression. So um, can anyone describe what what the structures are? The ones, the one in the middle. Emerald vein. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And then laterally would be. Common femoral artery, and I think yeah. it's the greater saphenous is coming in. Yeah, perfect, perfect. So this is called Mickey Mouse sign, whether you believe it or not. Um, but classically, it's it's um, common femoral, common um, yeah, the common femorals, um, saphenous femoral junction, and the um, uh, the great saphenous vein. So this saphenous femoral junction is a really important part to find. Uh, this is somewhere where clot can can sit. And it's one of your key landmarks if you're doing kind of a three-point um, vascular ultrasound compression. It's just some examples of a, a thrombus within within a um, within the common femoral vein. So I guess the key thing about looking for DVTs is that you make sure that you compress to get wall-to-wall -wall apposition. Um, a very, very acute thrombus often you can't even see it on ultrasound. What you will see is a filling defect and a vein that is not compressible. Yeah. Moving further down the leg, um, anatomy at this point. Anyone? Yeah. 
bit profunda coming off. So simply, this is just the superficial femoral artery and vein, but remember that the superficial femoral artery is overlying the superficial femoral vein. Often you need to put a little bit more pressure on to try and completely um, oppose the walls of the um, of the superficial femoral vein. And you may need to use your other hand to stabilize on the other side of the of the leg to as a kind of opposition to the to the compression. Um, and it is pretty much impossible to trace this all the way down. You often lose it around kind of in the in the distal third of the upper leg. Um, but you trace it down as far as you can go. And then lastly, you're going to look in the popliteal fossa and you classically get the popliteal vein and artery adjacent to one another. And then you want to trace that down as distally as you can go to find the popliteal trifurcation. And then you know that you've done a relatively complete, at least three point focus scan. Yep. It's just an image of where you would put the probe. Um, obviously we can't always sit our patients with the legs over the end of the bed, but we can move it to the side. And, that's how we do it. and these are just some examples again of the superficial femoral vein with a clot sat in it. This is clearly a slightly more chronic clot because it's pretty hyperechoic. Um, and this is one in the popliteal vein as well. There's just something on the chat. Oh, yeah, no problem. Um, and oh, have we got lastly, and this is just an example of actually recording of doing a compression scan. So we've got several options of how we do things. You might just want to look at several points. So you might want to look at your um, saphenofemoral junction, your um, your superficial femoral vein, and your popliteal vein. But the best way to do it is just to try and trace it down as far as you can go. So doing kind of two to three centimeter um, uh, movements each time and then compressing as we go. And that's normally the best way to try and identify a DVT. Yeah. Any questions about that? And that's all I've got. There are any questions at all? Anything I can do? Any questions? Chris, that was a sensational session. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, difficult to stress how important some of that's going to be for exams. That's really, really great. It's worth it. I'll record this session, obviously, be available to look back on. It's um, highly, highly relevant stuff. That Okay. Thanks, Chris. Are there any questions for Chris? Thank you, Chris. That was really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, very helpful. Thanks. No problem. If you learned something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for, for watching. watching.